Prequels, reboots, and sequels have become a mainstay of popular culture in the last few years, but one franchise did it before it was cool. We recently put out a video talking about how to watch Star Trek in order, and there we mentioned the Calvin timeline running parallel. Well, today is all about providing that context, and so we are going to be doing a deep dive into how and why the Calvin timeline came to exist in-universe, what events led to its creation, and what it means for the future of Star Trek. Let's get into it. Before we get too far guys, please take a moment to consider subscribing. If you like Star Trek, then we are sure we have something for you coming up very soon. So hit that subscribe button and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any Star Trek lore. Thanks guys! So in 2005, the last Star Trek live action series, Enterprise, was cancelled ending with the troubling conclusion, these are the voyages. This ended a continuous run of live action Star Trek projects that lasted over 20 years. It's fair to say that Enterprise had a rocky run, and by the time of its cancellation, the franchise was in a pretty bad shape. It desperately needed new blood and new ideas, and a new start whilst paying homage to what had come before it. Enter J.J. Abrams. J.J. Abrams was faced with a unique task at the time, to create something exciting and modern from a franchise that had been running for over 40 years. It must encourage new fans as well as please the old. It's still debated to this day whether he achieved his goal or not, but what came out of this problem was certainly unexpected. When production began in 2008, it was decided that they would set this exciting new film during the era of the original series, but not quite as we know it. What followed was an intriguing storytelling decision that had its roots in the far future and continues to impact the Prime timeline today. Here is the in-universe story of the birth of the Kelvin timeline. In order to tell this story, we will be taking our sources from Star Trek Picard, Star Trek The Next Generation, Star Trek Discovery, the Star Trek Picard novel, Last Best Hope, and the comic book called Countdown. In 2382, three years after the death of Data, Jean-Luc Picard, captain of the USS Enterprise E, received a communication from Starfleet Command that he should return immediately for a discussion of significance. Shortly after, he was informed that the Romulan Sun was going to go supernova. Because of his outstanding work as captain of the Enterprise, but also his familiarity with the Romulan people, he was consulted on what exactly the Federation response should be, demanding that Starfleet mobilize to evacuate as many Romulan citizens as possible. He was immediately promoted to Admiral and removed as commander of the USS Enterprise E, a ship that was never seen again. Now, it's unclear canonically who took command of the Enterprise, whether it was Worf or perhaps another, but that is a subject for another video. It became clear to Picard very quickly that this was going to be more of a logistical operation than a heroic charge into action, and so he set about creating his staff. Meanwhile on Romulus, the Romulan Senate was looking into their own research and was suppressing knowledge of the impending apocalypse. The Federation did their best to reach out to their counterparts and press them on the very real danger again and again, offering new information and research gathered remotely. Ambassador Spock of Vulcan remained on Romulus at this time, still working quietly to establish reunification between the Romulans and the Vulcans. He became aware of the impending catastrophe and went before the Romulan Senate himself. But the Romulans' stomach for deception was too great and they did not heed the warnings. Spock, who was fully aware that they were making the incorrect decision, decided to stay on Romulus regardless to continue his work. By now, Picard had assembled a team including former Chief Engineer of the Enterprise Geordi LaForge and Lieutenant Raffi, formerly of Romulan Affairs. Between them, they mobilized the creation of a fleet unseen by the galaxy, all in aid of helping their enemy. But soon they realized that the specialized work needed to create that many starships simply could not occur, as there were not enough skilled workers to make it happen in time. So they turned to Bruce Maddox, a cybernetic engineer and head of the Daystrom Institute. They instructed him to create non-sentient androids to deal with his work. He was not best pleased at this, but he did as he was bid, and the Daystrom Institute began putting out these machines. Work then began producing Wallenberg-class ships under the watchful eye of Geordi LaForge at an extraordinary rate to begin ferrying refugees from Romulan space to new worlds. Picard and Raffi were given the USS Verity as their flagship, and alongside the retrofitted and brand new ships, they began the slow process of moving the millions of Romulans. Meanwhile, on Romulus, things were beginning to take a turn for the worse. Though the authorities maintained that there was no risk and that their people would be safe, the truth had begun to seep out. 
And what's worse, the Federation calculations place the size of the supernova at substantially bigger than had initially been predicted by the Romulans. This was no longer a local threat. Now, Ambassador Spock could do no more on Romulus and decided to leave with his followers. But not before he made a defining promise to the Senate, that he would save their planet. A Vulcan saving Romulus would be the ultimate step towards reunification, which was no doubt a major motivator for Spock, aside of course from the countless lives he would save. And so he left Romulus, and on his way he passed another ship, the USS Verity. He and Picard shared a few words as they passed one another, but did not speak to the other about their plans. Picard was in the business of evacuation, Spock was now in the business of preservation. In 2385, a group of rogue synthetics destroyed the Utopia shipyards, and with them countless lives and the rescue fleet were lost. Public opinion was already turning against the relief mission, and this was the final straw. The Federation cancelled the mission, and with it, Admiral Picard resigned his commission. The evacuation of Romulus was doomed. It now became more important than ever that Spock was successful. The Romulans had been too secretive, too proud, and it was now too late to evacuate the remaining citizens from their worlds. But finally, Spock and the Vulcan Science Academy had their answer. Red matter. It had to be manufactured from decolithium, a substance that was very rare and only a few ships were equipped to mine. They called upon the mining vessel Narada and her captain Nero to do this. So the red matter was made, but it was almost too late. The galaxy looked on as the Romulan sun went supernova. Spock arrived in time to deploy the red matter and halt the expansion, saving many lives and assuring galactic peace, but too late to save Romulus. Nero, incensed by the loss of his home, wife and family, blamed Spock and confronted him. Both ships were consumed by the black hole. To John Luc Picard and the rest of the galaxy, the loss of Ambassador Spock in the line of duty was the final punctuation mark on the disastrous mission. He would go on to rejoin Starfleet and help see some justice for the Romulan people, but he would never know the true fate of his friend Spock. But in time, the truth would be known. During the Temporal Cold War, Lieutenant Commander Yor would travel between universes and come to understand that a parallel version of their own reality had been created. By the 3180s, long after the Temporal Cold War was done, mirror and parallel universes were better understood and the truth was known. The truth that Spock had not perished in the wormhole, and that he had created a new universe by travelling backwards in time which interfered with established events. In this time, he saw the destruction of his own planet Vulcan as well as being reunited with his long-lost friend, James Tiberius Kirk. Spock couldn't return to the Prime timeline, and so busied himself in trying to organise the relocation of a great many displaced Vulcans, reflecting Picard's efforts to help Romulus. Eventually, Spock passed away, but the Kelvin timeline he helped create lived on. This is a unique storytelling decision and opportunity, one that allows the Prime Universe to continue uninterrupted whilst having a new place to try out stories in the Kelvin timeline. Indeed, this decision can be seen reflected throughout this parallel universe. It seems that over the years the technology of the Narada and the scans sent to Starfleet by the USS Kelvin were reverse engineered by people like Admiral Marcus, and this allowed for the creation of wildly different starships. The design of the Constitution class was adapted to incorporate this technology, resulting in a faster, bigger and technologically distinct version than the one we see in the Prime Timeline. This universe essentially had a massive technological leap forward, which could mean a lot of things for the future. We saw what happened when a technologically advanced ship made its way from one universe to another in Star Trek Enterprise, with the USS Defiant. So could there be a similar incursion from the Kelvin timeline into the Prime timeline? We know that travel between these universes is possible, so why not? There is also a whole host of stories that could be revisited and explored from a different perspective in the Kelvin timeline. What would the Dominion War have been like with that technological burst hundreds of years before? Would the characters from this era be the same? And how would the galaxy get by without Vulcan? What impact might that have on galactic politics and the Federation itself? Could it bring about reunification sooner? Leave your thoughts in the comments down below. The Kelvin timeline is a controversial topic for Star Trek fans, but I wanted to make this video to give an overview of how these two timelines connect and celebrate the interconnected storytelling created by the series of films. Anyway, that's it from me today, my friends. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Live long and prosper, and I will see you next time on Federation Outpost 111.